Well, I'm feeling mostly about how different it looks now than it did 45 years ago when I was here. Of course, it was just the valley here at that time and no water to speak of. We're now right over where the town of Enfield was, about 150 feet down. And I was an engineer on the Clobbin job and my wife and I, when we were married in 1934, we set up housekeeping here in the village of Enfield, just about under where the boat is now, right opposite Mount Ram, which you see in the background. The old Quabbin Valley is now the Quabbin Reservoir. The massive lake was constructed in the 1930s to satisfy faraway Boston's water needs. It was created by damming the Swift River, 65 miles west of the city, and flooding the towns and villages below. The 2,500 residents of Enfield, Dana, Greenwich, and Prescott had to abandon their farms, their factories, and their homes. Every structure in the valley was dismantled, every grave disinterred, so that nothing could contaminate the water supply for Boston's 800,000 people. All that remains are the highways running to the water's edge, the mountains appearing as mere islands, and the water. Well, of course, there were the three villages in the valley, Dana, Greenwich, and Enfield, and then there was the one village up on the hill, which was Prescott. Dana was just a small town, store and a dance hall and a church, and a rural community. Used to have Saturday night dances there. It was about the only entertainment. All we were told was how bad they needed it. They would all have dust on their tonsils in a year or two if they didn't get our water. Well, we weren't so miserable or class of people that we were going to deprive anybody of their drinking water. Quabbin has sustained Boston for 40 years, but it is now inadequate. A plan to divert water from the Connecticut River to supplement the Quabbin has polarized the eastern and western parts of Massachusetts. The conflict is the same as it was when the Quabbin was built. Do urban needs justify the taking of rural resources? Bostonians have searched for water since the first settlers arrived in Massachusetts. Governor John Winthrop and his followers landed in Charlestown in 1630 and quickly discovered the land had little pure water. They moved to what is now Beacon Hill to drink from its fresh spring. By the 1800s, contaminated water was causing thousands of deaths from typhoid fever. Health concerns prompted the city to extend aqueducts westward in the 1840s to tap the pure waters of Lake Cachituate. This was still not enough. The city supplies could not extinguish the Great Boston Fire of 1872. The Department of Public Health intensified the search for pure inland water. Their report in 1892 recommended that all towns within a 10-mile radius of the capital abandon their own supplies and become members of one water district to be administered by the Metropolitan District Commission, the MDC. The report also suggested flooding an entire valley in western Massachusetts to create a massive reservoir that would solve Boston's water problems for many years to come. The outcry from residents of the Swift River Valley was echoed by an independent commission. They were convinced that less drastic alternatives were available. The plan was stalled until 1926, when engineers, handpicked by the governor, recommended its construction. The United States Supreme Court ended all opposition in 1931, when it determined that Boston's needs took priority over speculative harm to less populated areas. They got in the uh, surveyors and engineers to survey off the land. It was exciting for us young people, as you can imagine. Gee, all those handsome guys. And, and then 
they would uh, tear down the houses, and then they brought in a, a thousand what they call woodpeckers from East Boston to cut down all the trees. It was just like shaving a man's head. I strongly suspect that none of them had ever seen an ax or a saw before in his life, and they came out here to, to clear the trees. Then my brother was in charge of digging up all the bodies. Everybody had to be dug up that was known to a man. The first day of August, 1938, they ordered everybody out of the valley and put guards to shut it up, and it was closed to traffic. But the thing that got me the most was when that damned wrecker come along down picking up the rails on the railroad track. That hit right to home. That was the end of our railroad and the end of our village. The problem, I think, that uh, we're faced in Massachusetts specifically, New England perhaps, is the uh, distribution of water, where uh, some communities, of course, require a greater amount, a quantity of water, than what is actually in their community. Uh, therefore, it has to be brought in from other communities that have a surplus of water. However, the problem being that those with the surplus amount of water realize that eventually they'll need it, and uh, there, thereby the conflict. The, the metropolitan area of, of Boston in eastern Massachusetts has most of the population in the state, but uh, the greatest part of the resources, and in particular water, is out here. So Boston has looked westward and westward for its water supply, extending its aqueducts. And now they've built Quabbin Reservoir, which is on a tributary of the Connecticut River, and so effectively they've taken some of the flow of the river. Now they propose to put another pipe over and directly into the river. The water siphoned from the Connecticut River would augment the Quabbin in case of a shortage. In the 60s, a drought drained the reservoir to 45% of capacity. Were such a drought to occur now, the system might not be able to quench Boston's thirst. The reservoir system can safely supply 300 million gallons a day, but residents and businesses are consuming 315 million gallons a day. Towns outside the metropolitan area are demanding water from the MDC because they have lost their own supplies due to chemical contamination or because their need has surpassed their supply. To augment the system, the MDC has proposed diverting water from the Connecticut River and sending it to the Quabbin using the Northfield Mountain Pump Storage Station. The Pump Storage Station is an electricity generating plant on the banks of the Connecticut River. It operates by pumping river water through a hollow mountain to a holding reservoir at the top. The water is pumped at night when demand is low using excess electricity from other power plants. During the day, when demand is high, the water in the holding reservoir is dropped 700 feet through turbines inside the mountain to generate electricity. The water is then returned to the river. During a day of operating this boat, we can watch the river go down and we can watch the river come up. If we come out here on Wednesday morning, the river is generally low. If the plant starts to generate, we can watch the river come up. Now, I'm talking about 20 miles of river between dams. And that will give you an idea of the extent of this procedure and the amount of water and time involved. If the diversion is implemented, a portion of the water being held in the mountaintop reservoir will be sent by an underground aqueduct to the Quabbin Reservoir, 9.8 miles to the east. Although no land would be flooded and no homes destroyed, the diversion is perceived in the west as a repetition of the taking of the Quabbin Valley a half century ago. Diversion opponents dispute Boston's right to take water from western Massachusetts, but fear most of all ecological harm to the river and its banks. Unfortunately, the debate has been centered around uh, a threat of immense environmental damage to the Connecticut River and its environs when, in point of fact, the amount of water to be withdrawn from the Connecticut River and the circumstances of flood skimming 
almost cannot be measured. It's so insignificant. On a normal year with the Connecticut River, we might be able to take water 20 times. The conditions would exist where we could take water 20 times. If we don't take the water, then it just flows out to sea. No, it goes down the whole Connecticut River before it gets to the sea. And it does a real lot of things in between. For one thing, even in the flood period, the high peaks scour the channel, removing especially the fine materials that have accumulated in the stream channel. And those fine materials are very often things like sewage and industrial effluent. And now all that stuff is scoured out during the flood period. And besides that, scouring away those fines produces rocky or sandy bottom habitats that are the spawning places of various kinds of organisms. The statement that there will be irreparable harm to the Connecticut River, I think, is premature. Uh, I see no way of saying that at this point in time. We simply don't have the data that says whether there will be an impact or there won't be an impact. If you look for a point at which there's a, an absolute deterioration that anybody would notice, it'll never come. And it's a little bit like the story about uh, putting, the f putting a frog in, in a pan of water on the stove and then heating it up so slowly that the frog never knows when to jump. There's never a moment at which it becomes suddenly much hotter. And you can just gradually boil a frog that way. And that, that's what I'm afraid of, is that uh, with the frog that's going to be boiled. The Connecticut River flows 410 miles from the Canadian border to its estuary on the Long Island Sound. Its headwaters are the Connecticut Lakes in northernmost New Hampshire. As the river flows south, it defines the border between New Hampshire and Vermont, then cuts through Massachusetts and Connecticut. As the ice thaws in the spring, the river swells. By the time it reaches the large dams in Massachusetts, it's a torrent. The diversion would skim these floodwaters and send 1% of the river's annual flow to Boston. I don't know how 1% of the flow can affect the deposition of the soil on the land. If we were talking 40%, I would agree with you 100%. It is true that the diversion would only amount to 1% of the river's annual flow. However, as Dr. Brower has pointed out, the pumps can pump up 375 million gallons in 1.16 hours. And by operating the pumps at the middle of the night, they would be reducing river flow by 41% on the average during pumping operations. I believe that would have a completely different picture of environmental impacts than looking at it as being merely 1% of the river's annual flow. Besides the threat of ecological harm to the Connecticut River, the diversion may pollute the Quabbin. The river contains sewage, parasites that prey on freshwater fish, and nuclear contaminants from power plants upstream. The Quabbin is so large and pure that eagles fish its waters and coyotes prowl its banks. Adding Class B water to the Quabbin may endanger not only the water supply, but the wildlife sanctuary, a valued resource in the West. We don't consider the river ours so much as we know that whatever goes on in regard to that river is going to affect us most intensely. And that what we're asking for, indeed what we're demanding, is a share in the decision making that goes on in regard to that river. I think you're more likely to have a river flowing here in 50 or 100 years if its management is put under the people who get to see it every day rather than people who are 100 miles away and just barely aware that the river is even here. I have difficulty with the concept of ownership of resources, and I use ownership in quotation marks. I think that uh, I view the resources in the state as resources of the Commonwealth, and I think that the, the responsibility is to see how those Commonwealth resources can best be used to the appropriate advantage of the Commonwealth. Concern over the taking of Western Massachusetts resources has its roots in colonial history. Tension in Massachusetts between the urban east and the rural west came to a head in 1786 with Shays' Rebellion. Daniel Shays, a Revolutionary War hero, led a band of 1,100 men in an attack on the Springfield Arsenal, protesting the jailing of Western Massachusetts debtors by the provincial government in Boston. He plotted his revolution in Conkey's Tavern in the town of Prescott, a site now covered by Quabbin. He was soundly defeated by loyal state troops. 
but the legacy of his anger remains in western Massachusetts, and the highway that runs along the Quabbin Reservoir bears his name. I think there is a definite schism at times between those of us here in the western end of the state and people in the eastern end of the state. This probably comes from a lack of understanding of the other people's points of view. And this is one thing that I think we do see when it comes to something such as taking resources from this river basin and moving them to the east, that there's a natural feeling for those of us out here that the people in the more urban centers of the state are just out to get what they can get. Obviously, Boston could not supply itself on a self-sufficient basis within its own borders. It simply doesn't have the well capacity or the amount of water available to uh, meet its needs. It's got to get water from elsewhere. At, at the present time, the system is operating at about 98% capacity. If you ask me, do I think we're going to have a water shortage problem or any strain on our system or the MDC system in the next three, five, seven years, I'd say no. But do we have to look at things like the oil crisis and say people were saying, look out, look out, beware, beware, and have to always get burnt before we do the advanced planning? Water supply, sewage treatment considerations have to be planned in the 20, 30, and 40 year range. Good evening, an investigation is underway in Amherst as to why all of a sudden the water shortage got out of hand, forcing the University of Massachusetts to be closed down. Bruce Frosch has more on the investigation and the water supply level in town. Even on showery days like today, the campus pond area of UMass is usually a beehive of activity. But the campus has been evacuated for the most part, and absent are the students and the thousands of gallons of water they consume each day. Amherst is in western Massachusetts on the border of the Quabbin, yet it cannot drink from the reservoir. Demands for Quabbin water are coming from communities across the state. The MDC feels that the Northfield diversion is an efficient way to augment the reservoir so that more towns could be served. We're talking about a Quabbin Reservoir system that at the current level supplies about 40% of the population of Massachusetts. It is clearly the largest wholesaler of water uh, in the state. And so when we're talking about a solution, we're not just talking about one mechanism, one pipe. We're really talking about a way of thinking for that system, that utility, to supply water, not just in the first 10 years, but maybe in the next 20 years or 50 years. In 1975, the cost, according to the Corps of Engineers, would be about $75 million to build the diversion works. I'm not sure that for $75 million, you couldn't save just about as much water by fixing leaks in the MDC system. The city of Boston is on the move with the problems of wasted water. We have an ongoing program of leak detection. It's been very successful. Part of the problem of unaccounted for water is, is meters under registering. And I mean, last year we tested 54 meters. 18 of the meters were found to be not working properly. And, and through those 18 meters, the Boston Water Sewer Commission was losing revenue of over a million gallons a day. A lot of times the, the, the water pipe will break and the water will come up to the surface and those leaks are repaired right away. But a lot of times the pipe will break and the water will find its way in, into the ocean or into the sewer and it can go undetected for years and those are the type of leaks that we've been looking for. Uh, the geophones are like a doctor's stethoscope. We can hear the water escaping through a small hole in the pipe 10 feet under the ground. We, we, we were only accounting for around 50% of the water in 1976. In 1979 we accounted for 60% of the water. The MDC is exploring other alternatives for augmenting water supply. Selective tree cutting in the watershed is now increasing stream flow to the reservoirs. Other rivers could be diverted, or a giant aquifer near Boston could be tapped, and improved forms of conservation would raise reservoir levels. If the water resource base of the Commonwealth, which I believe belongs to the entire state, is not going to be shared statewide, that is, if the Connecticut Valley wants to keep their water resources in the valley, the implication is that growth in the eastern part of the state should stop, and it should go out to where the water is, in the Connecticut Valley. I wonder if that's something that valley residents really want. The bond issue passes Tuesday, there'll be $8 million to build an aqueduct in the reservoir. I'm doing it. 
going to be a lot of irate citizens when they find out that they're paying for water that they're not going to get. Oh, that's all taken care of. See, Mr. Gibbs, either you bring the water to L.A. or you bring L.A. to the water. How are you going to do that? By incorporating the valley into the city. Simple as that. How much are you worth? I have no idea. How much do you want? No, I just want to know what you're worth. Over 10 million? Oh, my, yes. Why are you doing it? How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can't already afford? The future, Mr. Gibbs. The future. Now, I recall being at the opening of Quabbin when the water first came over the spillway, and it was quite a thrill. We were standing on the spillway bridge, and the water came over the spillway dam and right on down into the Swift River. And then you could see the uh, result of uh, many years of work and the labor of a great many people and the, uh, let's say, the heartbreaks of a great many people finally uh, ending up in an accomplishment that was a real engineering feat. And I think that it was the salvation of Massachusetts. Back in those days, uh, transportation wasn't what it is today. We didn't figure that they could ever build a tunnel through. They thought Boston so far away that perhaps they'd just forget about it. Well, it wasn't a matter of how you felt, really. There was nothing left, only that to do. Either you either had to work on it to get out on the other. And I didn't want to leave till I had to. I've been asked if people were angry about this losing their property and the takeover. Um, they, they weren't angry. They weren't angry people. They were simply heartbroken. It's not a feeling of resentment because it was a necessity, but it's just a feeling that all the old sentimental things aren't there anymore. For any individual, whether a major action like that was worth it or not, I think is very difficult to determine. Obviously, for someone whose life was disrupted by it, it was not worth it in the same way that it may be for the millions of people who have drunk that water ever since. Well, of course, in those days, uh, people were very much against it. Everyone in the valley was, was dead set against it, but there was no organization in the way that we know of it today. We had no... Uh, environmental societies or anything like that to help us protest it. So while there was just as much feeling against the project in those days, there was not the action against it that you would probably find today. Well, I think that a lot of citizens are beginning to stand up and uh, take their place in their government and not simply assume that what any governmental agency or what any bureaucracy says is right. Quite obviously, for those of us in a minority, those of us here in western Massachusetts, we might not completely trust the general court, so to speak, because we can count the numbers like anyone else, and we can see that if push comes to shove, the votes are not with western Massachusetts. A question I've been trying to ask and try and information I've been trying to get from the critics for almost seven or eight years. What is it? Is there a common ground that we can get to? What is it that the critics want? Is the answer absolutely no? Go away. Don't ever bother us. Uh, we don't want to hear from you people. I think that the people of Western Massachusetts are concerned that the people of the metropolitan area of Boston have an adequate water supply. And I think the middle ground is for us to uh, really be serious about finding the best solution to that problem. What they don't understand in my uh, mind is that uh, water is a commodity of life and we need it. And uh, even if this project was to go forth and be completed and never necessary and never used, it would be well worth our while for to have the insurance. If we go ahead and just suddenly make a massive change in the resources in the state, it can have long-term effects. Therefore, we shouldn't be afraid to take the time and effort to study it and study it as well as we know how to today to see just what the effect on population, on citizens, citizens in Boston, citizens in Northfield, our neighbors to the north in Vermont, New Hampshire, and those to the south. It is definitely a complex issue, 
and I don't know as any of us will ever understand all of it. I just like to go back to the old place and walk around. It's got trees 40 feet tall in my front yard, in my backyard, but the steps down to the place where the home clothes, the well stones, the foundation is bulldozed in. And I found it interesting to go along the old stone walls. You have, that's the only point that you can take, is take a stone wall, and when you come to a barway, then you know where you are. So many people, if you didn't go into the history of the people that had to move, you stand out there and say, what a beautiful spot. You look at the water and the trees and think it's beautiful. It's beautiful to the eye. But I know what was there. So I've got two beauties. One to remember and one to look at. I want to welcome you all, and it's just a wonderful experience for me because it brings back all the memories. So we never know from one year to the next what person we're going to miss. Mr. Sam Thrasher, he was here last year, I remember, and he died on April 2nd. We just have a bar heads in a moment of silent prayer in memory of them. From this valley they say you are going. We miss your bright eyes and sweet smile For you take with you all of the sunshine That has brightened our pathway a while Come and sit by my side if you love me Do not hasten to be But remember the old Quabbin Valley And the ones that have loved you so true Way pretty, Uncle Don. From your home in this valley May you never forget those sweet hours That were spent in the old Cobbin Valley And the love that was changed in the flowers Come and sit by my side ere you leave me do not hasten to bid me adieu, but remember this old Corbin Valley and the ones that have loved you so true. One more time. Now you've all learned that chorus will help us this time. 